welcome everyone to the next episode of Leadership is Language. Uh, we're really excited to be bringing this to you and all these amazing stories and amazing people um, as part of uh, the YFC group. So today I have an incredible woman with me, Sally Murphitt. She is a farmer's daughter and she professes to having red dirt running through her veins. She is from the Apple Isle, proudly born and bred, but has a very national aware awareness around the Australian agriculture sector. She's got more than 20 years experience working on farm and with agribusinesses, and she has an innate understanding of what makes those businesses tick. This is from the paddock to the boardroom. She's learned in her career that bosses who don't value their people spend a lot more time trying to manage performance and problematic behaviour than those bosses that build wonderful relationships. And from personal experience, we'll tell you that a good boss will light the fire inside you, not underneath you. She's a HR strategist, project manager, facilitator and thought leader in the agriculture sector. She has an unshakable belief that the power in agriculture is people and she has an amazing way with positivity in words. And I'm really, really excited to introduce you to her today. So g'day Sally. Hello there. Hello young farming champions. Hello Emma. I'm so pleased to be here with you. We're so excited to have you. So Sally, can you give us a little bit of a background of you, of where you are, and, and what a day in your life looks like? Well, that's a really interesting question because the day in the life of Sally Murphy can vary from any day, uh, from one day to the next, depending on, on what's going on um, in my clients' lives, for example. So typically I'm doing HR health checks with organisations, but the, the, for the most part, I'm helping people, uh, agri leaders, have purposeful conversations both in business and in life. I think that's probably the best way to sum it up in a nutshell. Yeah, awesome. And what's your background? So are you off a farm or and from an agricultural background? Yeah, so I started out my working career on farm um, as a rural trainee. I spent the first two, uh, six months of my working life on a dairy farm on the northwest coast of Tasmania and then later transitioned that into onto my family farm uh, again on the northwest coast of Tasmania. So I've been involved with agriculture for the last 20 plus years. I hope that doesn't give my age away too much. Uh, but I've been involved uh, for a lifetime, whether it's been on farm or with agribusiness companies. So as you said at the beginning, I, I do have an innate understanding of what it takes um, to make an agribusiness um, an agribusiness tick successfully um, and that's because of my wide variety of experiences that I've had along the way. Yeah that's awesome. So what's your education journey been like from from school to where you are now? It hasn't stopped. Um, I nagged my mum and dad from a very early age. Um, my first year of high school was at a, a regional high school on the northwest coast of Tasmania and absolutely hated it with a passion. And so I nagged mum and dad to let me go to a district high school, which was about 30 k's away from where we, where we were living at the time. Um, and it was the best thing ever. Because, and the reason that I nagged them to do that was because that school offered, it was a district high school and it offered agriculture as one of the subjects that you could study at the school so that was completely up my alley I didn't know I knew that I wanted to be involved with agriculture but where I would actually fit into into that into the industry I just really wasn't sure and so my my education has been very practical along the way you know I've done this the standard rural traineeship as I mentioned before and gone through to do the associate diploma uh, in agriculture and then I've started doing some stuff at uni as well and also doing a certification process at the moment so yeah I at any stage of my career I'm, I'm happy to pick up the books and and uh, yeah get into it I, I have a philosophy that learning doesn't stop just because you've left school I'm, I'm a passionate learner and take every opportunity that I can to do so 
Yeah, that's awesome. I'm a bit like you. I believe the day the day we stop learning is the day we shouldn't be doing our job anymore because we're not not interested. We've lost that passion. So can definitely vibe vibe with that hundred percent. Yeah, so, yeah. So what what for you? What's the thing that gets you out of bed every morning with agriculture? The people. Yeah, look, it's it, it, very simply the people. I love the characters, the innovators, um, the the rural and regional areas. Everything about it, I just love. But it primarily comes back to the people. Yeah, there's some pretty special people in the ag. Um, sector that's a hundred percent sure so as part of your job I imagine um, you're having to facilitate and participate in some pretty um, interesting and, and tough conversations with clients at times around um, various different aspects of their um, business and, and what's going on in their lives and, and something that relates to me and really resonated with me um, when I was uh, excitedly tasked with the job of interviewing you is, is your background in succession planning and, and assisting farmers to improve communication around that and what in what is, you know, can be quite a stressful time and, and, and distraughtful time for families. And, and I have seen it in a consulting basis, you know, tear families apart, it's heartbreaking, but done well is, is fabulous. And and uh, my partner's family are, are starting that process now. So, so watching um, on the sidelines as, as it all unfolds. Um, so, so for you in, in your role, um, how do you approach these kind of situations and, and how does language really assist you in your role with these businesses? Yeah, well, look, what excited me the most when I was invited to participate in this series that you've got was the title of it leadership is language and it's so true leadership is language as a as a, a child growing up my mother used to always say to me sally it's not what you say it's how you say it that's the problem and so i guess in in hindsight that's probably what has led me down this journey of trying to understand the people dynamics of any given situation um, i've been even from an early age, I've been able to walk into a room and very quickly understand what, what the real lay of the land is. You know, people might be smiling and having a conversation or whatever, but I, I can pick up on the energy of a room very quickly and, and determine whether it is actually, in fact, all rosy in that particular space or whether there is some, some conflict that has potentially taken place. So I think it's really important, you know, one of the hardest conversations to have in whether you're in a, um, a bakery or a, a, on a farm or, or wherever, one of the, some of the hardest conversations are, are, in my view, the most important conversations to have. So I think we need to look at, you know, when we're going into these situations, we need to look at uh, whether it's succession planning or transition, whatever you want to term it, there's a bit of a trend these days to head towards transition of ownership and management rather than using the terminology succession. But whatever floats your boat, um, I'm happy to go with whatever. But when I look at the, the times in my life when I've had to lean into some difficult conversations or needed to have them, there's, there's probably been two or three reasons, maybe even the fourth reason why I haven't actually gone down that path and had that conversation or plucked up the courage to do so. The first one to my mind would be that I've been really concerned about the response from the other person because I value that relationship and I don't want to rock the boat in any way. I've wanted to avoid the conflict um, and I, I, pretty much every situation I go into that is is the main aim. They've, they've just wanted to keep the harmony in the workplace or in the in the family unit uh, just so that you can get along and get a little bit of productivity out of the situation and just keep things rolling. The third one for me, I think, would be sometimes perhaps I just didn't have the right words. I didn't know how to say what I needed to say. And then if there was a fourth one, I'd say that sometimes I might have actually reflected on the situation and, and thought to myself, well, is this even my place to have this conversation? So. 
I find it really interesting in agriculture. You know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about grain prices and the weather and what the stock market's doing and even what the neighbour down the road's doing wrong. But we just don't actually lean into those really difficult conversations. And they're the ones, as I said at the start, they're the ones that really matter. When, um, when people, when, when I have a client in front of me and they say, look, we've been really avoiding this conversation, don't want to have it, you know, help us through it. I always ask them, you know, avoidance at what cost? What is the emotional, mental, the physical, uh, the, the cost to the family, relationships, um, or even the business? What is, what is the cost? What is the, the payoff for not having this conversation? And so my aim for our, our session today is to give you some tools and resources along the way and if the technology gods play with us today, then um, show you a little, um, a couple of uh, slides and a little video that will help us along that journey of understanding ourselves and how we, what, how we have impact on other people in any given situation. So we're likely to do that today by looking at two, maybe three key areas. And the, the two primary ones I wanna get through are the value of relationships, because that's just so important in anything that we do. It doesn't matter whether you're in a sewing club or the tennis club or whatever, relationships are key. The second one is understanding communication. And I'm, I want to look at this from two points of view, understanding communication styles, but also understanding uh, generational drivers. I think uh, that's really important given that in this day and age, we can potentially have up to five different generations working in a workplace or within a family unit at any one time. So I think it's really important that we have a little bit of a focus on that as well. That sounds amazing. And it sounds like a, a, um, a really great toolbox um, of information that we can take with us into to any of those tough conversations uh, that we've got to have regardless of, of what it's about, but I 100% agree. It's, it's amazing, um, guilty of it myself, how we deflect the tough conversation because we're not sure we have the right words or we don't want to upset um, the apple cart. So, yeah, really, really excited. So when we're, when we're about to step into or lean into these tough conversations, where should we start? Look, it's a it's a really interesting conversation, really interesting question. The where do you start? I think the, the the first place to start is understanding yourself, and I'll I'll probably get to that in the moment in a moment. The number one question that I often get asked when there is a difficult conversation to have, whether it's workforce or whether it's a family unit, is how do you get people to the table that um, don't actually want to be a part of the conversation? And people are looking to me for a magic formula and I'm, I'm sorry to say that I, I don't have one and I don't think there's anybody else out there that would actually have one either. Because at the end of the day, the people that are involved in this conversation and need to contribute to it have to want to be a part of it. There's no point kick, um, dragging somebody kicking and screaming to this conversation if they just don't want to participate because that's where conflict starts. You know, and if you've got conflict in the, in the situation, that's where things go pear-shaped very, very, very quickly. So before you embark on these conversations, it's actually really important to consider what is the potential impact of not having this conversation. And then you need to ask yourself, can you actually live with the negative consequences of the current situation if you don't actually address the situation that's, that's happening right before your eyes? And the other one that I ask clients to think about is what do you value most? Do you value your Christmases and your Sunday roasts as opposed to valuing having ownership or management of the family, of the family farm? So there's some really important questions you need to think about before you get into this situation, into a conversation of this nature. So what if the parties can't agree? That's, that's another, another situation that I come across quite, quite regularly. And I think it's important to, when you're in that situation, you need to actually take a step back from it and understand 
what is it that you actually can agree on? Is it that you want the, far the family farm to continue on? If that's the answer, then yes. That's great, that's, that's your common ground. But how that happens might be a different story and that is often where the conflict comes in about how, the, how things are structured and how things will operate from that point on. If somebody is um, coming to that, that conversation not in a positive way, it's usually because they're concerned, they are fearful, um, and may even be confused about the process. So being in that mindset where you are happy to show up and be in service of other people, so you're not there for your own personal gain, you're there to help facilitate a productive conversation, that's really important. And I think the other one that is potentially missing out of the equation is um, a code of conduct. How are we going to behave in front of each other during these sessions and be even beyond the sessions as a family farming business unit how are we going to play in the sandpit together so that that's sort of the you know the, the background stuff that i think needs to happen as i said at the, the start of that point i think you know we need to understand ourselves first and i think sometimes the hardest conversations that we need to have are in fact the conversations that we need to have with ourselves so to get clarity out of um, out of the situation, you really need to understand what you want out of the situation and how do you do that? So you do that by talking it through with somebody that's not actually engaged in that particular conversation. It might be another uh, distant family member, it might be a friend, it might be uh, the neighbor down the road, whatever, just somebody that's not emotionally um, contracted to that particular situation. Write yourself a letter. So what, what would be the best outcomes that can actually come from this situation? And perhaps even create yourself a bit of a business plan because often what I find is a lot of people actually go into these conversations, if I can say it in, a, in a, you know, an uneloquent way, they go into it for their own personal gain and for selfish reasons. Okay, and they haven't actually sat and processed what they want out of the situation. And that's where that, that um, when people can't get clarity out of what they want, that's where they get tangled up in the conversations that they need to have. I think the other thing to do in a, in a situation like this is to pay attention to the energy that you're actually bringing to the table. I think that's probably one of the, the biggest ones. You need to ask yourself, is the energy that you're bringing to the table supporting those that are around you or is it actually having a negative impact on them? Um, again, come to the conversation clean and clear and you do that through going through some of those processes before by talking to somebody, writing a letter, creating a business plan, whatever you need to do to get to that point where you're actually very clear about what your intentions are and what the positive outcomes you want to come from the conversation. I think leaving your ego and drama at the door is probably the biggest one. You know, people come into these conversations and something's happened along the way and they've been processing this story in their head about what that situation means. But it's not actually fact. There's often not a lot of fact in that particular situation. So, you know, being able to step out of your own space and look at it from somebody else's perspective and perhaps even have that conversation to say look hey uh this this thing happened last week and this is the story that i'm making up in my head about what that means is that actually the case and it might actually have been that that person just had a really crappy day and that you know they were worried about getting to the school bus stop in time to pick up the kids or they had a um, a family member that was at home sick or something's gone pear-shaped on the farm, you know, the head is, um, you know, blown up or something, you know, it has no correlation to the particular scenario that they're dealing with at the time. It's just that things have not gone right and they perhaps weren't in that space to have a productive conversation at the time. Um, and so, yeah, I guess the other thing is, to, to my mind, is about being able to do your own work around all that.
you know, before you actually go into these conversations, you need to actually sit down and, and get very clear and concise about what's going to, what it's going to take to have a productive conversation with your family members around the, the transition of whether it's transition of responsibilities, ownership or management, whatever that looks like for you. Yeah. So, so in a kind of to summarize all of that up, you could kind of say you need to do the work in the background with the planning, understand what a win looks like for you, but also understand what a win looks like for the bigger picture relationships with your family, as well as for the business, make sure you do that work. Um, make sure that when you walk in the room that you're leaving your past in the past um, and anything unrelated at the door along with your, your ego and you walk in clear-headed and ready to um, have a really productive conversation, try and pull the emotion out and show up to do the best for that business. So it's kind of like a real rough, short, sharp. Would that be about right? Yeah, I think that snaps it up pretty well. Yeah. yeah and I think there's there's a sec there's a second part to that, Emma, and that is that you need to understand the landscape that you're walking into as well. So I mean I've got a bit of a framework that I've been working on. Um it's not quite there yet, but I'll talk through some of them, which may actually help some um some people that are watching this call. And that is I think um you can use an acronym part so people approach the relationship and potentially the timing as well so when you look at the people component of um you need to look at what are the what are the characteristics of the the people that are going to be sitting around the table what's their personalities are they prepared to show up to this conversation and be transparent because if they're not there's just no point in having the conversation so being in a position where everybody is prepared to talk about the, um, you know, the debt, the, um, the assets, uh, cash available, all of that sort of stuff, you need to be able to talk about that stuff. It's, it's no longer a private matter between mum and dad. It's, you know, you, you're talking about essentially going into business together. So that needs to be, you know, people that are in that conversation need to be prepared to lay that on the table. I think the other thing to consider is when it comes to people who actually needs to be around the table in addition to the family members. So is there a business coach that might help? Is there a financial planner? Is there an accountant or perhaps even a legal professional that needs to be a part of this to help with the structuring of what might become of this particular situation? Um, I won't talk too much about it now because we'll talk about it in a moment, but understanding the communication and the generational drivers. Uh, again, we've, you know, got four or five different generations involved in our family farming businesses now. So understanding what each particular generation's bias is for the want of a better word, what their filters are is actually going to help you have some more productive conversations as well. And if there is going to be a prickly personality around the table, so somebody that's going to try and assume power of the conversation, you might want to consider whether you actually need somebody to be an independent third party to essentially facilitate the conversation so that it has the ability to contribute in a fair way to the conversation and that one person is not ta yeah, taking over the conversation. Okay. The other part is the approach. So I think you need to ask yourself, um if the conversation i need i think you need to ask yourself if the conversation is actually based on some loose assumptions because in my experience nine times out of ten it's um it's it's stories that have been made up in a person's head that they bring to the table and they think is the reality when that is in fact not the case so the other part of the approach is understanding the other parties attitude towards risk and money so there might be somebody that's a part of that mix that can live really frugally and is prepared to do that for a period of time you know, often it's the parents they say you know look we got a really good start in life and we want to do that for our family as well so we're prepared to live on a minimum wage um, and not draw too much out of the business so that that gives the next generation a chance to get a great start in the business and there are other people that, you know, 
they don't mind how uh, you know how much the money's being dished, how quick the money's being dished out uh, and they just have no they have no um, they have no appreciation for the risk or um, formal processes and systems or frameworks that might support um, helping to manage that as well and uh, the other part of the approach I think it's really important that you actually document these conversations so you do formal minutes of it but also in that process, if there, if, if you get to the point where you get to an agreement, it needs to be in writing because if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. You know, while the relationship may be great just at the moment, you know, things happen in life, relationships fall apart, uh, you know, things go pear shaped very quickly and, and, the, and the landscape changes. So having those sort of things in writing is actually really important. So but some of the things that you would need to get in writing, how a person gets in or a party gets in or out of the of the partnership, uh, are there lease or sale agreements that potentially contribute to this conversation? What are the assets? How will it be transitioned? Are there powers of attorney? Uh, you know, once if you're getting into the estate planning side of things, what are somebody's health wishes, for example? I think that's really important to understand. And um, as a as um, my own farming family uh, on the northwest coast of Tasmania, we re we sat down in February to have our first conversation around this. And even though we we get on really well, like we we're a very um, very close knit family, our communication is great, but even in that conversation when you started talking about somebody's health wishes at the end of their life what their uh, what their medical uh, wishes are as well when it comes to how they will be treated to the point of end of life it can actually get really really it's in a really emotional com conversation to have and so you know while we did get along very well or we do get along very well as a, as a family once you start talking about some of those really challenging topics you know, that can sort of spark things in, in people that they didn't really know that was actually sitting there. So that's why it's important that we, when we have these conversations, it gets recorded. Um, so relationship, that's, that's the next part of this. Uh, we, we spoke before about if somebody's not prepared, not willing to be at the table, you need to ask yourself why. Why are they not prepared to be a part of this conversation? Is it because of the relationships that are there? Do they, they just not want one party to benefit over the other? Do they not like um, brother Joe or um, sister Kate, whatever that might be? Or what I find is the people that don't want to be a part of that conversation, it's often because their needs aren't being met. And that's the, I think that's the really big key. That's where conflict often comes into play is because somebody's needs aren't being met and they feel left out or they feel jolted as a part of that. So it's really important that if somebody's needs aren't being met, we actually create the space as a, as a family unit to go back and set those foundations, have some deep and meaningful conversations about what you really want out of the situation. And if you can set those foundations right and understand the situation from somebody else's perspective, that's where you're going to start to build trust and rapport. And when you've got trust and rapport in that relationship, that's where the magic happens. If you don't have trust, you don't have anything. That's what it comes down to at the end of the day. And then timing. So is it the right time to have the conversation? Is it, is it the right time to start this conversation? You, you really do have to pick your time in this. So if you're wanting to have this conversation and you're in the middle of harvest or planting or carving or weaning or whatever, when the pressure is really on, that's not a great time to actually to bring this conversation up. So really think about the, the timing when you want to have these conversations. Um, what else can I say about timing? Time, um, this process takes time. You know, that, that, that's the other part of timing, I suppose. It, it takes time. It's a complex process. There's lots of cogs that are turning in, in the mix of this in terms of 
um, the level of trust and relationship that's happening, people's personalities or communication styles, um, how they prefer information to be given or delivered at any given time. I think that's, that's important that, you know, you, you give people the grace of space. That, that's my terminology, is give them the grace of space. If things are not going well, you need to give them their own thinking time, particularly, you know, if you've got a, a personality that likes to reflect on decisions before they're made, then, you know, pushing them into a situation where you say, you need to make up your mind right now in this conversation, that's where you're going to get resistance. And if you've got resistance, then nothing, you know, everything falls apart. So I think, you know, those those four key areas where you're looking at the people that are involved in the mix, how you're going to go about it, what's the relationship dynamics like, and your timing. You know, when are you going to have the conversation and how a decision is going to be made? I think they're the, I guess that's the second part of the, of the mix is understanding the landscape that you're dealing with. I think that's such a great analogy. And, and I think you're right. Like, you know, how do you identify who are the right people that we bring to the conversation and, and, and do we really understand the, the personalities of all the people around the table, particularly, um, you know, you talk about spouses and stuff like that, which may not be blood related, but, you know, quite often siblings have a lot of similarities and certain traits that they carry. And then you have these external people that can come in and, and be quite different. Um, I know that I'm quite different to my partner's family and I could imagine that sometimes I could come across quite full on and quite abrupt because that's my personality. So that's me being self-aware yeah. of myself, but being aware yeah. of, of his family and how they operate. So I love your approach around knowing the assumptions, having a think about the risk appetite of everyone that's sitting at the table and, and, and documenting it is, is key. Because like you said, if it's not written down, you know, that mental story can change and someone said A and that turns into B and quite often I can see how those lines get muddled um, really, really quickly. Um, relationship <laughs> dynamics, I love your point about, you know, if there's someone reluctant to come to the table, well, how is this business and the relationship within the family not, not meeting that person's needs and, and how can we build that foundation and trust that they feel that they can come and join us at the table and yeah, timing. God, imagine trying to do harvest and then bring up succession planning. Whew, it would be like a meltdown in my house. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Why not just throw a bit more stress in there and the header breaks down and the truck driver doesn't show up and oh, the world's ending. I love that. I think yeah. that's really, really fabulous. So once we've thought about all of this sort of stuff and, and we've taken some time to reflect, we've done the work, We've done our part in the preparation <laughs> and coming to the table. So so what's the next step? Do, do we need to start then thinking about, Rado, what actually are the personalities that we're dealing with? Is that the next right step? Yeah, look, it's certainly one of the big ones. Um, communication from my point of view is probably where I get uh, called in the most to help out with um, family farming businesses. And I love a quote that comes from George Bernard Shaw. And he says that the single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it is in, in fact happened. So I, I, yeah, I just, I often just play that over in my head. The single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it's happened. And so from my point of view, communication is probably one of the most undervalued pieces of the family farming unit there is, which to my mind is, is kind of disappointing because good communication is actually what underpins a successful business. If you don't have good communication and you don't have relationship, you've got nothing. That's what it comes down to. Now, if the technology gods will play with us here, Emma, I am going to try and share something with you. Let's get our fingers crossed. <laughs> we have a winner. Now I've just got to learn to drive this. <laughs> so I think the, the most important thing in a family farming relationship is to understand the personalities that are actually at the table. So I, I like to, uh, when clients uh, call me in to help with a particular situation and things are going pear-shaped from a communication point of view, I like to talk my clients through this 
framework that I've come across and it's from a book called Pressing the Right Buttons from a lady called Alison Mooney, who's a communications expert in New Zealand. Now, there, I, I'll preface this with saying there are so many different frameworks out there that can help you understand the impact that you have on people and how other people have impact on you. So there's things like the Myers-Briggs, the DISC, um, there's so many different tools. I guess my, what I'm trying to say to you is if this one doesn't resonate with you, then go and find one that actually does because these frameworks are actually really, really useful. So Alison Mooney says that there are four different personality styles. You have a playful, a powerful, a peaceful, and a precise. So what you can see there on your screen is that a, a playful, for example, what they seek out of any situation is attention, affection, approval, and acceptance. A powerful looks for decisiveness, productivity. They want credit and loyalty for everything that they do and whoever's involved in, in, a bit in, their, in their world. A peaceful requires respect, they need value, they need loyalty, and they need harmony, and harmony at all costs. A precise requires sensitivity, they need space, they need silence, and they need support through any given situation. So if you think through um, you know, your particular situation and understanding the different personality styles that are around the table, a playful, they're going to bring the fun to any situation. A powerful will bring the action. A peaceful will bring the calm and a precise will bring order. Now, when, you, when you're in a, in a, transit, in a, a, a conversation about um, succession or transition, the peaceful, sorry, the playfuls are going to ask who, who's going to be involved with this conversation. A powerful is going to ask the what and when. So they want to know the nuts and bolts of a particular situation. The peacefuls are going to ask why. Why are we having this conversation? Why do we need to make this change? And the precises are going to ask how. So th that is it in a nutshell. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen there now. And go back to um, go back to some normal. <laughs> so when we look at those four P's, um, like when I look at that, I resonate with some of it um, and see that I have a fit in each of those squares. So when we're put in these um, like pressure cooker situations, like potentially you would be in that situation, do you find that you can slide between different personality types or do you tend to back yourself into the corner that makes you feel more comfortable in that pressure situation? Yeah, look, that's 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 a great point because at, we can we are dominant in one, but we can slide between uh, the different different areas. Like the the playfuls and the and the powerfuls, they tend to be your extroverts. So in that you can see in that grid, or you could see in that grid, that the playful and the and the powerful are on on the top quadrants. On the bottom quadrants, you've got your peacefuls and your precise, and they tend to be the introverts. So they, that's where they go to find their energy and their power. So they, they retreat internally to do that. So they're the ones that you'll find sitting on the couch or reading a book or, you know, whatever it takes for them to, to have the energy to be present in any situation. So yeah, you're you're right. It absolutely, um, you know, you can you're a dominant personality, one of these four, but you can slip into uh, different um, different personalities depending. I think it's situational. So I'm a I'm a playful in life, and I'm a playful in business. So nothing much changes for me. But in some situations, I've had to learn to be a peaceful. For example, I've had to learn to slip into that introversion to whether it's to protect my own energy or help protect the energy of others that are in that particular situation. Sometimes I need to slide across into the powerful and be more assertive. So I'm the, I'm the sort of person who goes, oh, hey, let's not worry about it, you know, whereas the powerful will go, nope, this is what we need to do. This, you know, we need to do this and we need to right now. They, they're very assertive about any given situation. But the, the thing I want to be clear about here, though, is that, these are four different personality styles. Sure, there is a dominant one. Uh, like you, you tend to be a dominant one and you can slip into others depending on the situation that you're in. But 
no one personality style is better than the other. They're just different, you yeah. know? And I've, I've had people come up to me and say, look, you know, I'm a, I'm a peaceful and I, you know, I've got all these different personalities around me. How do I get, how do I get a bunch of peacefuls in my business? And it used to be a question that threw me off quite a bit because I'm like, hell no, you, you don't want four peacefuls in your business. <laughs> You need a mix of the personalities and the attributes that they bring to bring to your business, your community, your industry. You you need that that mix of of people to um, yeah to to get great outcomes. Ask all the questions, look at it from all the angles, be part of it. I can see I can see how like yeah, if you had two two playful people potentially, you could go round and round a bit because everyone's just being happy and, and, and doing their thing. But, you know, you, you start throwing some of those other styles in and they start pointing directions in certain ways. Um, you know, it, it helps to direct the whole group. So I can definitely see um, the benefit from having a little bit of everything in the mix. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, you know, moving on from communication styles, we then move into generational drivers. Yes. And this is, this is one area that has fascinated me for a long time and so I, I think what frustrates me the most about uh, generational dynamics is the other generation's perception of the next generation or vice versa so when I go into a business I often hear something like the older generation will say you know the younger generation are just lazy and self-centered and entitled and then you get your, the younger generations that go, look, mum and dad are just dinosaurs and they're stuck in their ways and they, they just want to control everything. And so this for me was actually a, a really cool point in time where I started researching what were the drivers of each generation? How do they interact with each other? What experiences have they had along the way? And as you can see on the screen here, we, I've got a bit of a, a graphic which comes from, if you're interested in looking at the complete thing, it's from search McCrindle research. McCrindle research, I think it is, I, sim I think it's simply called communication and generational drivers. And you'll see, uh, you'll see a big postcard. And essentially what it does is it looks at, and as you can see on the screen, it looks at each generation, you know, from the baby boomers right through to the, our current generation, it looks at the experiences that they've had, the exposure to technology that they uh, may have experienced along the way, um, things like leadership styles that have been prominent in that particular generation. So the older generation were much more authoritative in the way that they led and managed people. And so it was all reward, you know, task and reward. You do this, all this happens sort of thing. Whereas our current generation are more, they, they want to be involved in the conversation. Um, and so if you're using traditional leadership styles or approaches to manage the current generation, again, conflict, you know, this is where we're going to butt heads together. So I think this graphic is actually really important because it's very visual. It can show you that, you know, the, the prime ministers of the time, it shows you, you know, in my generation, the biggest thing in technology was the old um, pocket Walkman. Like we thought we were made when we had the old Walkman. Can you imagine walking around with a Walkman now? Like <laughs> most kids these days probably don't even know what a Walkman is or a tape deck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I know, I know we're really pressed for time here, but I guess I want to, what I want to say to you guys is that my main message is, is to, to have better conversations and stronger relationships. We need to stop gossiping about each other. We actually need to create the space where we're going to sit down, reflect on, on the, the contribution that each generation brings to the table, what our filters are, what our perspectives are. Um, and then you need to, you know, you just need to keep circling back and create that space for grace. As, I, you know, as, as the saying goes, the, the grace for space. If you don't have the grace for space, then you may as well not be a part of the conversation. Yeah, that's so interesting and so relevant. Um, and, and even in my role, and you'd be the same in, in all of your other consultancy roles, 
you can see that uh, for me dealing with growers with crops you know even just father versus son or even the get the three generations together and and then the things that take priority and and um, the way they speak about the crop and and the way that they assess risk um, is is very different and and I think that there's there's got to be credit given to every generation for their take on life and the opportunity they see and the risk position that they have and and if you communicate and can bring that together beautifully well the power of knowledge and the power of opportunity that could potentially bring um, on on every front yeah that would be amazing I couldn't have said it any better myself well done Emma <laughs> <laughs> thank you so um, but we're running out of um, running out of time, which uh, is really disappointing because I find this such a really interesting uh, um, topic just for life in general. So, so in kind of of, of summing up or, or coming to the end, is there is there anything else that we need to be thinking about, or, or anything else we need to be um, uh, aware of when we're walking into these situations? Uh, regardless of that tough conversation around, you know, how do we keep our language positive and, and what's, you know, what's, what's, what's those sort of considerations that we have to think about? Yeah, so, uh, oh, look, there's, there's so much. I think that going back to the original point, understanding yourself first, you know, get to, get to a situation where you're at peace with whatever happens. If it works out, it's great. If it doesn't work out, you know, know the value of your time, figure out what your return on investment is. And if you can't come to a decision, you know, draw some lines in the sand. If you can't come to a decision by this point, this is our next strategy. This is where we need to go. You know, because a lot of people just, you know, this is an ongoing process. They just keep on going and going and going and going. And during the process, there's lots of stress involved. When you've got stress involved, your cortisol levels rise. And I'm told by health professionals that, you know, cortisol can actually last in your system for about 26 hours. So, you know, that can create some significant health problems, you know, right through from, you know, gut issues to migraines to anxiety. Like, we just don't need that. So you've got to be very clear of what your frameworks are and what you're prepared to accept and what you're not. I think that's the first part of it. The second part of it is to... Um, you know, as, as we begin to wrap up, I think is knowing, uh, knowing that nothing happens without relationship and communication. If you can't get this part right, nothing else is going to happen along the way. So invest in this process, invest in yourself so that you can, you can sit at the, at the table and have these conversations that are going to get great outcomes for yourself and great outcomes for the family. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's so, so relevant. Um, so just two quick things just to finish off. Um, this one's a bit of a left fielder. I didn't pre-warn you on this one, so I apologise. But, but for you in your role and, and um, your leadership language that you carry with you every day, what's the, what's the one thing for you that, that you would say is the most valuable or, or most important with any conversation that you're having? Mm, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a, it's a pearl of a question, in fact. My, my main message um, to that or to this point would be to understand the value of learning to edit your story. So if, if you're in a situation and you, you come to it and you say, mum and dad, you know, they're just so, you know, they're dinosaurs, they don't want to change. They, uh, they just want to control us for the rest of their life. They won't talk about succession. You know, it's game over. You know, you're bringing lots of negative energy and lots of negative language into the conversation and that's not productive in anyone's book. If you can learn to edit your story, so come up with a, a simple statement about it, so rather than mum and dad are dinosaurs and don't want, to, don't want me to be a part of the farm, flipping that language around and going, okay, succession or transition is not a priority for mum and dad right now. Simple as that. Yeah. It's a completely different story, isn't it? Because... The first scenario, you've got tied up in the emotion and the ego and the drama of the situation. And so you've started making stories up about what this means, um, in this, what this means in the conversation. And it's not true. Often it's not true. If you, if you actually I want to give you a framework, okay, that I learnt recently, which I think is really, really handy when you're in, when you're thinking about having these conversations, 
you know, whether you're talking workforce management or whether you're talking about the transition of ownership or management of a, a family farm. There are three lenses that you should look at any situation through. That is the reverse lens. So look at it and say to yourself, what would the other person say about this situation? If I'm not making a story up in my head about um, how they react to the situation and what that means, what would they actually say about it? The second one is the long lens. So understanding how would you feel, say, three, six or 12 months down the track about this situation? Are you going to be worried about it then? If you're not going to be worried about it, then perhaps you shouldn't be worried about it right now. And then the third one is the wide lens. So looking at the situation and not being in a victim mindset and going, what can I learn from this? What nuggets of information can I take out of this and what can I grow from? How can I become a better person by looking at, uh, by being involved in this situation or looking at it from these different lenses? So, and that's that's a model I learned recently, which comes out, It's it's got some good um, credibility behind it. It comes from the Harvard Business Review. Um, and it's from an article that talks about how you should be managing your energy rather than your time. Oh, wow. I really like that. How do we manage our energy? Yeah, that's very cool. And I love that frame perspective, um, that long view, something that I've been using for a little while now, you know, am I, is it worth crying over? Well, will I still be crying over it in 12 months time? Probably not, yeah. so move on. <laughs> like, have your little moment and move on. And, and and I love that reverse and that wide. And I think it's so important that we take the opportunity to learn from from every situation that's thrown at us, whether it be good, bad, or or otherwise. I think that's brilliant. And my last question, just to finish us off tonight, if people would love to consume more Sally, hear more from you, see more about uh, what you're up to, how can they reach out to you or, or find you? So, yeah, look, that, that's really easy. So across all the socials, I'm Inspire Ag Oz and on my website, inspire-ag.com.au. Yeah, look, I really, I really on a personal level uh, want to thank you. I, I found this conversation just, just so insightful and, and you've probably seen me madly scribbling notes down and, and just filling my mind with, with, so many t tips and tr tools that I can use um, at home, but also every day with my clients. You know, I'm always having tough conversations, and, and it's a, it's it's hard to bring yourself to have them. And I think that some of this is is so translatable um, in, in everything that we do. Um, and I know that there's going to be a lot of YFC and the and the wider community that that we associate with that are going to find um, so much so much goodness out of this conversation around something that's so topical and can be so emotional. Um, so I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, and um, yeah, just thank you. Amazing. <laughs> Oh, look, the pleasure has been all mine. Um, I'm, I was really delighted to be asked to be a part of this leadership series. Uh, as I said at the beginning, leadership is language. And if you can learn to master that, you're, gonna, you're just going to get so much further in life. And so thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for everything that the Young Farming Champions are doing in this space. You're an absolute credit to the industry and I'm, I'm just so privileged to be a part of it. Thank you.